So I want to start a video about trading card games with one of the most legendary moments in worldwide sports history. It's Jeremy Lin Sanity. Tomorrow night, you go to New York and you deal with the Lin Sanity. Have you been following that story at all? What? Jeremy Lin, are you following that story at all? No idea. I know who he is, but I don't really know what's going on too much. Man. Are you surprised at the production that Lin's had over the past week? I don't even know what he's done. And the Knicks will win it. Lynn Sanity continues here at Madison Square Garden as the undrafted point guard from Harvard electrifies MSG once again. Uh, the Cup in general, uh, his chances. Um, I just, I don't know the deck he's playing that well. Uh, well, I just keep hearing stories of people saying, I lost to Frank Kids and I don't know what they yeah, and did. I still don't know what they do after <laughs> I lost to them. In early 2012, Jeremy Lin went from being a player who was barely in the NBA to being a national superstar overnight. He came off the bench of a struggling New York Knicks lineup where a slew of injuries is the only reason he was even put on the court. This is where a player who no fan, no pundit, no coach or analyst even heard of started racking up triple doubles like it was nothing. Jeremy Lin would set the NBA on fire. And so Linsanity would last a full month. The Knicks would go on a seven win streak and the Jeremy Lin hype just consumed the media. But eventually things had to change. Knicks franchise player Carmelo Anthony had to return back to the starting lineup and just like that, Linsanity was over. Knicks head coach Mike D'Antoni would end up resigning and then the Linsanity system went ahead and crumbled. Jeremy Lin was no longer the Knicks superstar. And a lot of people say that Lin Sanity was one of the biggest underdog stories of sports history. But in my opinion, it's even more than that. Jeremy Lin was more than an underdog. And as YCS commentator Tom Payne puts it, as he watched his Dinka Bowie pull off the most incredible upset in YCS history. Like called an underdog? <laughs> this was unknown. <laughs> In Yu-Gi-Oh, the supposed best deck doesn't win all the events as often as you might think. Innovative duelists are able to find ways to beat the metagame, the game within a game, to outplay the mass majority of players. Or some players can just play the best deck and still win. At Team YCS Sao Paulo, Pakawat Permonza and his team with Kamal Crooks and Ruben Penaranda was able to pilot Unchained to win the whole event, a deck that had hardly been on anyone's radar prior. Joshua Schmidt was able to take Bistille Runic, a certainly known quantity, but certainly not in the top 10 decks to win that 20 deck format's YCS. There have been even times in the heat of a dice roll heavy nuclear bomb FTK format where, you know, people would just win on their first turn. Someone brought a deck from 2015 that was basically unchanged and won the UK national championship with it. Shout outs Tom Rose, I guess. But all of these little upsets, YCS Milan was in a different solar system. The day is November 16th, 2018, and hitting store shelves is the new Yu-Gi-Oh! side set, Hidden Summoners. However, the community sentiment regarding this set was, well... And then I'm really gonna be harsh on this set. So you guys who want to white knight this in the comment sections and defend opening packs and all that, get your pitchforks ready. I don't think prank kids will be performing past the regional level and it's gonna struggle even there i just don't see a future of them and i'll eat my words if it tops a ycs i will eat them if you didn't get it right there hitting summoners was not a well-liked set upon release it was kerplunked into the middle of a firewall dragon ftk format a format where 
Most competitively viable decks would seek to win the game on their first turn by completing an infinite loop of cards to win their game on the first turn. The primary enabler of this deck was Yu-Gi-Oh's Link Monster Poster Child, Firewall Dragon, coining the term FTK, or First Turn Kill. Hidden Summoners brought in the Nephitis, Mayakashi, and Prank Kids archetypes, all decks that just couldn't hang in this kind of format. If it didn't FTK or could play up to 12 hand traps, it wasn't worth playing. The decks also utilized three card combos instead of two card combos or were too slow to which decks like Sky Striker could just simply outpace them in a longer game. In addition with three card combos, it makes it difficult for your deck to execute their strategy consistently and just fail to stack up to, well, an FTK format. And so Hidden Summoners would be one of those sets that would just be lost to the sands of Yu-Gi-Oh! times. And so little people paid any mind to it and just continued their Firewall Dragon FDK. The day is November 30th, 2018. It's nine days before YCS Milan, and you pick up your iPhone 6 to watch your favorite Yu-Gi tuber. See you I think so maybe but it's just it's just a bit odd so moving on down the list all right well <coughs> nothing banned so far so i mean oh god oh my god oh my <coughs> they fucking banned him they fucking banned firewall dragon firewall dragon the poster child of link monsters a card that many people thought would never get banned because of its importance to the Yu-Gi-Oh! storyline and anime and branding, well, had just been forbidden. Some were sad, but many rejoiced. It was the end of an era in Yu-Gi-Oh! But while people were celebrating, top players in the game were scrambling with only nine days to find a new strategy that wasn't an FTK. If your deck was not named Sky Striker, it basically had to play some form of Firewall Dragon. So what can we even do now? Common consensus descended onto one of the few decks that could already sort of function without Firewall Dragon. These were the newly released in Soul Fusion just a couple months earlier, Thunder Dragons. Thunder Dragons were already a known combo deck that could utilize the huge combos that Link Monsters allowed but it could also function very well without Firewall Dragon with in-archetype win conditions like Thunder Dragon Colossus slowing the game down to a halt. Also backed up with massive monsters like Thunder Dragon Titan, Thunder Dragons could slow down the game, basically stun your opponent out, and then just switch all their monsters on the next turn and attack for game. Most combo decks would just wither in the face of a Thunder Dragon Colossus, preventing you from adding cards from your deck to your hand. Alongside the fact that Thunders just had a very good resource loop, so they could also enter into grind game and play out a back and forth game if needed. If your opponent wasn't playing an FTK, Thunder Dragon Colossus was the next format super threat. However, opposing the Thunder Dragon deck was an already known quantity in Sky Striker. Sky Striker was a control deck that could play enough hand traps to stop the FTK, and if the game dragged out into a long amount of turns, would be the most favored deck to win. As well as being deadly consistent with the only starter you need being Sky Striker Ace Ray to get your snowball rolling. And with the quick play spell, Sky Striker Mecha Widow Anchor being one of the most incredible forms of effect negation and removal for the time. So now with nine days to Milan, those were the two premier decks at the forefront of the Yu-Gi-Oh! community. These decks were safe, known quantity, and it's hard to guess other decks that could realistically compete. Thunder Dragon Colossus could check Sky Striker, and at the time, it was mostly considered that Sky Striker could deal with any rogue threat. 
Sky Striker was just a better deck than any deck that has been printed prior to it. There were some last Dark Warrior hurrahs, despite losing Firewall Dragon. A decks like Altergeist would also emerge, trying to directly counter the Sky Striker strategy, being able to play copies of Secret Village of the Spellcasters to prevent Sky Striker players from activating one of their 30 to 35 spells in their main deck. And so just like that, that's your format for YCS Milan, close the book, and let's play. But one person who didn't do that was Dinka Bui. In a format slated to be dominated by Sky Striker, Thunder Dragons, the last hurrah of FTKs, and Floodgates galore, Dinka Bui decided to load up with Prank Kids from Hidden Summers. Earlier that year, Dinka Bui had done something extremely similar. He had brought Burning Abyss to a 2300 player tournament and scored his first runner-up position and YCS top. He's gonna pull it off again, this time with an even bigger upset in Prank Kids. So let's see what this deck is actually going to do. Prank Kids are a link summoning and fusion summoning spam strategy. Okay, hold on, quick aside. The card art on this card, uh, they're just so good. Like they tell so many stories in just a single image. Anyways, back to the video. How they accomplish this is that each prank kid has an effect that when used as a material for a prank kid's extra deck summon, can summon another prank kid from the deck, giving them an explosive amount of link infusion material every turn. Alongside the fact that all extra deck monsters have ways to recur prank kids from the graveyard back to the field. So if you aren't going to do a good job at clearing a prank kids field, you're in for a nasty OTK going into turn 3. Also, the end board was oppressive, with Prank Kids Pandemonium able to fusion summon into Battle Butler, a quick effect Raigeki during your opponent's turn that could put a number in the various combo piles and Thunder Dragon decks running around the tournament. And if you needed help dealing with back row, the Link 4 could do the same for spells and traps in Rip Roar and Roaster. Despite all these awesome sounding effects, Prank Kids is not a good deck. There are many glaring weaknesses. To begin, in this format, there are one card combos, with Sky Striker Ace Ray able to start a snowball going for the Sky Striker strategy. The normal summon of Armageddon Knight is a complete full Dark Warrior combo. Thunder Dragon has Battery Man Solar to start a lot of its plays, but Prank Kids doesn't have this kind of consistency. Instead, a lot of Prank Kids hands needs to start by drawing two Prank Kids in a fusion spell to keep going, which is basically a three card combo. So the deck on paper is just a brick fest. And in practice, it is pretty close to it as well. Prank Kids needed something external to actually push it to be able to not just top an event, but win. And that was the format. Thunder Dragon and Sky Strikers were slated to be the best deck, and Prank Kid had an unbelievably one-sided matchup versus Thunder Dragons. With Thunder Dragon Colossus that I've been talking about, Prank Kids are one of the only decks in Yu-Gi-Oh that do not need to add cards from their deck to their hand. They just summon Prank Kids from the deck over and over again. I am Heavy Weapons Guy. Prank Kids were skipping steps in that time of Yu-Gi-Oh. And Thunder Dragon didn't have much else besides the Thunder Dragon Colossus preventing searching. So as long as your deck was able to play through Colossus, it wasn't really a big problem. The issue was, there were hardly any decks that could. And the big thing as well for Prank Kids is they could make one of Thunder Dragon's biggest counters, but it wasn't really realized until after the event. And that was Borolod Dragon. Borlo Dragon would be able to take control of an opponent's Thunder Dragon Colossus, and funnily enough, Thunder Dragons couldn't play through their own Floodgate effect. So Prank Kids had a basically auto-win matchup versus one of the premier decks in the format, and it was Dinka Bui, the only person who recognized that. Now, I could rave about how great a Sky Striker matchup this deck had, but played perfectly, Sky Striker honestly had a pretty advantageous moment versus Prank Kids. 
The key card in the Prank Kids deck was Prank Kids Doodle Do, a link to that could add any Prank Kids spell trap from the deck to their hand, allowing you to get Prank Kids Pandemonium and begin to execute tons of fusion plays. One Widow Anchor on a Doodle Do could do a number onto the Prank Kids board, and the Sky Striker player has a very high chance of making it to the next turn and continuing the long game plan that Sky Striker seeks to execute. But this segment is all about external factors, and there's one extra thing that helped Dinka win this matchup. No one had bothered to read a single Prank Kids card prior to this event, and Dinka Bowie was gonna weaponize that. You have to try and figure things out on the fly instead of sitting down for hours trying to understand what the Prank Kids strategy is trying to accomplish. That is the advantage Dinka was wielding. He's playing an objectively worse deck, but no one knows what his things do. So going into Swiss, Dinka ends 9-2. He even gets onto a feature match where he plays against a Gem Knight FTK player. The problem is his opponent knows exactly what all the Prank Kids cards do. I have a full Prank Kid deck in my bag currently. Oh. I've read all of the cards thoroughly and I've played out locals a bunch, but I haven't like, I don't know any of the combos with the new cards. But not many people were as fortunate as that Pendulum Magician player. Dinka tears through a Thunder Dragon and Sky Striker laden top cut, and he's fortunate enough to dodge the very difficult Altergeist matchup that his deck has. He played another couple feature matches here and there where he actually took down Andres Torres. At the time, was not as decorated, but was the winner of YCS Mexico City and won UDS Monterey. He is one of the greatest duelists who is playing impeccable Yu-Gi-Oh at the time, but even in the top four, people still don't know what Prank Kids cards do. So Dinka Bui is in the zone. After taking down one of Yu-Gi-Oh's greatest players of all time, he has one more hurdle to jump over, Federico Makotsi. Federico is in and out of top cuts. He has a chance to achieve the Yu-Gi-Oh dream, however, to win a YCS at only age 18. This year, he made top 64 at the European Championships and finds himself piloting a strong Thunder Dragon deck through top get. But Dinka has his fork and knife out to take down yet another Thunder Dragon opponent. So let's see what the most insane meta call and the biggest upset in YCS history looks like. In game one, Dinka executes his optimal but oppressive combo. It's just a single Link monster and one set Prank Kids Pandemonium. It really is just that simple. So Federico moves to play and even establishes an exceptionally strong Thunder Dragon combo. But as he plays, Dinka isn't even moving. Remember, this Prank Kids Pandemonium can summon a Battle Butler whenever he'd like. But Dinka realizes that Battle Butler is not his win condition here. The thought process here for Dinka is that if he wastes his Battle Butler early on, there's possibilities that Federico could just have the right extenders and maybe wind up OTKing Dinka instead. So Ka instead goes for Weather Washer, which is opting to play a slow grinding game. The monsters he summons back cannot be destroyed by battle through Weather Washer's effect, so they can make it to the next turn to be fuel for a crackback. But despite facing down Double Colossus and Titan, which is the premier end board of the format, with most decks probably just instantly conceding when they see this, Dinka will play on to win game one. But look, I'm not here to show you what a YCS winning sequence looks like in the very first game. Let's watch Dinka pull off the biggest upset in YCS history. Remember, Dinka is playing a quote, bad deck whose cards the Yu-Gi-Oh community refused to read up until Dinka was activating them on their screen to turn the premier end board into mincemeat. In game two, Federico goes first with his Thunder Dragon deck. But again, there is no known strategy to beat Prank Kids. So Federico just does what he's been doing this entire tournament. It's Double Colossus and Titan once again. But this is the exact end board that Dinka wants to play into. Again, many decks in this format would just concede when they see this, unless they open the perfect hand to deal with it. But Dinka's deck is made for this. Now, he hasn't opened wildly awesome with something like an instant fusion. It's a couple of prank kids in a fusion spell and a called by the grave, 
which to be fair, he hardly even needs. First, Ka fires a pot of desires, removing the top 10 cards of his deck from the duel in order to draw two cards. This finds him another prank kid and an infinite impermanence. And like an absolute gamer, he doesn't even use the infinite impermanence to stop the Thunder Dragon Titan from being able to destroy cards in his field. It's Chainlink 1 Fanzies, Chainlink 2 Roxies, Chainlink 3 Rocket Ride. Fanzies dumps Prank Kid's plan, the chain resolves, and two more Prank Kids come out from the deck. No shame to our commentator friends, Marcello and Tom Payne, but this just goes to show how little people knew about Prank Kids. It's not that easy to clear this board, f even for prank kids. From what we saw, at least, the main uh, way to do it was borrow load. They just mess about until they draw borrow load. Yeah, so unless they summon, I don't know, a Phoenix easy play. Dinka is kind of in a weird spot this turn. Surprisingly, he might have wanted any other fusion spell to go into his rocket ride. Prank Kid's Pandemonium locks him into only summoning Prank Kids for the rest of the turn, so he can't access cards like Borlo Dragon in order to take control of Federico's Colossus, the main win condition here for Dinka. So in this board state, Federico decides to use his only point of interaction to try and destroy Dinka's Rocket Ride by using Thunder Dragon Matrix trying to trigger his Titan. But Dinka just has called by, so it never even mattered. Federico, with no forms of interruption, just has to sit and watch as Dinka executes a full Prank Kids combo. Rocket Ride goes to tribute itself to summon the remaining two Prank Kids in the graveyard. With four Prank Kids on the field, Dinka Link summons into Bow Wow Bark, using the remaining two Prank Kids to summon two more Prank Kids from the deck. And you can just see the never-ending sea of Link material out of the deck that everyone just wrote off. Here's the Link summon of Doodle Doo, and fortunate for Dinka, he drew into another polymerization off of his Prank Kids Roxies, which allows him to fusion summon into a Weather Washer. Backing that up, he uses Doodle Doo to add back a Prank Kids Pandemonium and another Prank Kid. So he goes Weather Washer and Pandemonium Pass, which is nearly a mirror of the first game. It's probably what Dinka's also been doing all tournament to beat his Thunder Dragon opponents. The goal here for Dinka is to get it back to his turn, prevent the potential OTK from Federico in order to make a Borlo Dragon in order to start picking apart the board of Federico. From his empty hand, Federico draws into a very nice gold sarcophagus, which can banish any monster from his deck. But in the draw phase, Dinka uses his Weather Washer to resummon two Link monsters from the graveyard for some incredible card value. Bow Wow Bark contribute itself to add back more Prank Kid monsters from the graveyard to the hand to make a Battle Butler or any fusion summon with the set Pandemonium live. Federico will go to attempt to trigger his Thunder Dragon Titan, but Dinka Bui has so many ways to stop the Thunder Dragon Titan from connecting for a pop, alongside the fact that his Doodle Doo cannot be destroyed by battle. So as Federico tries to enter the battle phase, Dinka just goes Pandemonium right into a Battle Butler which floods the fields with three more Prank Kids effect triggering. So much so that Dinka has actually run out of Prank Kids in his deck because of his Pot of Desires. Federico probably was better off maybe not even attacking here, but with time running low, he needs to get damage in. This forces him to play into Dinka's Prank Kids plan in the graveyard. Another huge card that people are not expecting to be as good as it really is. Prank Kid's plan, when your opponent declares an attack, can put back as many Prank Kid's cards in the graveyard back into the deck to reduce the attack of the monster. It's not the attack reduction that's the big deal, it's the fact that Dinka gets to shuffle back sometimes eight or more cards back into his deck and extra deck to create a near infinite grind game against even the most control-based deck at the cost of a couple bricks in his deck. Federico is unable to completely clear the field of Dinka, just as Dinka intended. So Ka gets play back to himself, where he has three monsters still remaining on his field. So Dinka just link summons into the ace against Thunder Dragons, it's Borlo. And the crowd knows what this means. Once again, they enjoy the Borlo. Nice enough for Dinka, he even gets an instant fusion off the top of his 
that. The crowd probably going crazy. You can't blame them. This deck was definitely the underdog of the event, and it seems like he's, was he's it gonna even be like winning. Called an underdog. <laughs> this was unknown. <laughs> yeah. Not even. And it's a one-stop shop right into Rocket Ride. Dinka fires away, Link climbing all the way into a Boral Sword Dragon. Shot from the crowd, we're probably gonna get a out. countdown from the 10. Was he gonna make a Boral Sword as well? Wow. <laughs> Dinka does not need the clock to favor him, because as the clock strikes zero, he is swinging for game. Dinka Bui wins YCS Milan with Prank Kids. With Prank Kids is the winner of YCS Milan 2018. That was insane. We had a lot of emotions all week. Afterwards, this win would send shockwaves through the Yu-Gi-Oh! community. Everyone wanted to try their luck with the craziest deck to win a YCS, Prank Kids. However, it would take another three and a half years for the deck to ever find more competitive success after Milan. Why was this not the deck of the format? Why it's supposed to the Thunder Dragon Killer? The problem? People read the cards. Prank Kids had found a perfect storm of a metagame to jump into. Fresh off a ban list with a set community mindset in play for most of pro players, Dinka Bui found the perfect time to uncork an off the wall strategy. But after YCS Milan, people knew what Prank Kids did, were aware of the threat, and found out the conditions that they needed to beat the deck. For example, the biggest choke point in the deck was Prank Kids Doodle Doo. This card can add any Prank Kids spell trap, which typically gets pandemonium in order to allow fusion summons on their opponent's turn. Problem is, if an infinite impermanence or effect veiler hits this card, you are cut off from your biggest form of interruption and recursion your deck has. Dinka did what everyone dreams to do in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! But something like this may never ever happen again. Yu-Gi-Oh! media is expanding. People are genuinely reading all the cards, no matter how good or bad they are. Yu-Gi-Oh! players from five years ago are five times better now as well. Information spreads more quickly. People understand how to beat these decks. I mean, shoot, content creators are giving away free information when back then it was just deck profiles and metagame reports. It is very difficult to do what Dinka did in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, but he still finds ways even to this day. But I don't want to actually say that this is some sort of prank kid's accomplishment. It's more an accomplishment for Dinka Bui. This was his crown jewel in his Yu-Gi-Oh career. He was the man who connected all the dots for the perfect moment. This was his defining achievement as a player. This wasn't luck for him. He's done this kind of upset before, bringing a weird unknown deck and doing well with it. It just happened that he took it to a YCS and then won with it. And some players will fade out of existence after getting their big rogue victory. But Dinka Bui is still one of Yu-Gi-Oh's most relevant players to this day. The past two years for Dinka Bui, he has had more impact than just winning a YCS. He has invented numerous decks that have changed the Yu-Gi-Oh format. Every tournament, he finds a way to innovate. He never shows up with anything standard. Everything this guy makes is studied. And that is more valuable than any number of YCS wins. Thanks for watching. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay, okay. So in 2021, Prank Kids got like the most broken piece of legacy support like ever printed. It's a Link 1 for the, the Link deck. So the deck then became meta. It did some silly stuff for literally a year, like pack one of YCS with it. And then boom, Yamu got banned, deck dead. Now Prank Kids is still irrelevant. Bye. That being said, shout out to you, Zachary Jones, for staying with it on the bubble. On that note, folks, peace.